computer. So we are recording. Good. Well, um, welcome to Reaffilia. This is my fifth interview. Um, my name is Paul Humphreys, and these are interviews in Freshwater Science. And I'm very uh, privileged this afternoon, it's Friday afternoon, to be interviewing um, Dr. Brian Timms, who is somewhere out there in the ether. <laughs> at a distance, which is unfortunate we can't be in the same room together, but that's okay. That's the beauty of technology, isn't it? So welcome, Brian. It's nice to have you here. Thanks, Paul. And um, uh, look, I've, uh, what I do with most people when I start is actually look up your name on Google and see um, uh, if I can find some stuff about you, but also it always ends up finding people with the same name as you. And uh, you've got a a um, doppelganger who's uh, a doctor in the Royal Flying a Doctor Service. So um, they, they come up quite a bit, but I, I must admit there's not too many Brian Timses out there and um, your name and your, your, um, your career, not surprisingly, comes up very, very commonly on Google. So you'll be, I'm not sure whether you're pleased to hear that or not. But if um, I, I, I've, looking at your career, I mean, I, I'm impressed that you've got I worked at a 53 year publication record. Your first paper, I think was in 1967. And my students look at me as being quite old and, and long in the tooth, um, but you've got a, a much longer publication record than I have, which is not all that surprising. But anyway, um, you're a, um, I'm, I think I, if, you're, if you're happy for me to classify you as a invertebrate, uh, Salt Lake, temporary pond, taxonomist, come ecologist, <laughs> come biodiversity specialist. Would that be a reasonable description of your your work? I think so. Yes, I just put myself down as an invertebrate limnologist. <laughs> okay, so but perhaps with a bit of geomorphology thrown in. You okay. haven't mentioned that. No, I haven't. I haven't. And um, I was actually listing from your publications. I was the listing of the things that you've worked on over your career, um, and and I, I mean, just a potted potted list. Um, beetles. You seem to have a an inordinate fondness for beetles, as um, somebody <laughs> famous once <True>. said. <laughs> you've worked on rotifers. You've worked on cladocera. Um, Water fleas. You've worked on copepods. You've worked on quite a lot on Anastraca, the sort of brine shrimp, uh, on Conchostraca, clam shrimp. Have you worked on tadpole shrimp? Uh, a little, not much. Little. Um, <laughs> you've also published some papers on water birds. Oh yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, are you a keen twitcher, bird person? Not really. No. Okay. Um, I just the. Many, many of the little twitching birds are too small for me. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> the bigger water birds. Yeah. Um, you, so how did you, can I ask you, how did your interest in such things as these, um, these invertebrates in, and often in, in salt or temporary pond, temporary waters, how, did, how does one get into that sort of area in the first place? Because you're, you're, I think your PhD uh, includes that and also you did honours in 1965. Was that on similar sort of things? The honours was a two-year program in those days okay. at the University of Queensland. And I did a, I did a study of the zooplankton of a pond, of, a, right. uh, of the university pond. Uh, and my PhD was a comparison of three lakes in Victoria, one fresh, one partly salty, and the other one very salty but all in the same geomorphology or in craters of light of uh, explosion craters. So what I, I had a student um, working on um, plankton a few years ago and I've, um, you know, uh, so from, um, from temporary wetlands on a floodplain, but what gets somebody interested in working on, on these little critters in the first place? Why? They're amazing under the microscope in their structure. Mm -hmm. Uh, you sort of don't expect it, in a sense, because you can only just see them as blobs. Um, but my undergraduate study was in was on marine invertebrates. I was very keen on marine invertebrates as the University of Queensland, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. And our holiday place down at Bruins Head in, New, in northern New South Wales, I say down because I was in Brisbane at that stage, the invertebrate fauna is absolutely fantastic uh, between the tides and also below low tide 
So I would spend my holidays um, looking at, at, at marine invertebrates from year from uh, when I was 12 onwards. <laughs> so was that, was that a, um, did you, were you in, sort of encouraged or inspired by a family member to? to... I was inspired by a book. <laughs> oh yeah, what's Bacon's, the book? A and Seashores. Uh-huh. Uh, and um, a cousin of mine. But she was not a particular um, biologist. She just loved the, the, the colours of the sh snails and all that sort of thing. But I, I was a self-taught uh, on marine invertebrates. So I just loved them. Hmm. And I still do, but I've never done any research that way. <laughs> so that's just the hobby sort of thing? Or it's a hobby, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, were there, was there a particularly uh, inspirational lecturer or academic at University of Queensland? Yes, the prof. Prof Stevenson was the first year lecturer and also second year, third year. And he was very inspirational. And I worked as his lab assistant mm -hmm. on two long vacations. Right. And was he your honours supervisor? No, no, he was away the year that I wanted to do honours. Oh, okay. For the two years I wanted to do honours, he four for a year. So I had to choose something else. <laughs> right. So that was the accident which took me out of the marine into fresh water. <laughs> it often happens that way, doesn't it? Yes. It's just and serendipitous sort of thing. Yes. Um, but clearly you, were, uh, you got interested in that because you went down to Monash to do your PhD. Yes. And was that with Bill Williams? No, that was with Ian Bailey. Ian, Ian Bailey. Bailey started off as my honours supervisor, mm -hmm. but he left halfway through my honours. Mm -hmm. And I had to sort of finish it by myself. Okay. Uh, with some sort of supervision from Melbourne Cup to Brisbane, which was a bit awkward. I can imagine. Uh, yes. Yeah, because I, I mean, I went, I was an undergraduate at Monash and uh, Ian Bailey, Sam Lake um, were, were my lecturers there. And, and Ian was obviously a, a, a big influence on the people working on Plankton and, and um, was one of the co-editors of the, of the um, was, it, was it Bailey and Williams? Yeah, Bailey and Williams, the ecology book. Yeah. Ecology of Inland Waters. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. So it was great to have um, people like that around. And that was, so that was something, Ma, so what are, what are Mar Lakes? Just tell us what Mar Lakes Mar Lake is a, a, a volcanic lake due to one single explosion. It's, okay. Uh, so it just goes bang mm -hmm. and you get a big hole in the ground, usually round, usually deep. Mm -hmm. And nobody had studied these, these things before? Uh, yes, there had been minor study on them. Um, some study on geomorphology overseas, and I got stuck into that right throughout the whole of Australia. I mapped many of the Mar Lakes in Australia, some of them during my PhD, some of them afterwards. And I mapped them because I was interested in what the benthos living in them on the bottom. So are they pretty deep lakes? Well, yes. Um, Bull and Mary was my deepest for PhD. It was 66 metres. Wow. Which is that's a deep. lot of crawling up and down. When, when you... So how do you sample the benthos? This I is the, the bottom. The yeah, so the, I'll just explain the benthos is the, the animals living on the bottom, the, yes. the sediment. So how do you sample the benthos of a 60? You have a grab, which yeah. goes down, called an Ekman grab, which goes down open. And when it hits the bottom, you've got to hit it fairly nice and slowly. It sinks into the bottom and then you send a messenger down, which is a brass tube, which goes down and fires it, it closes the jaws and then you bring it up with losing the minimum amount of sediment that you can. You do lose a little bit. So what's, what's I mean, it, it, it's presumably it's pitch black down at 66 metres? There's animals down there, coronamids and worms. Yeah. And is, is there oxygen down there? Uh, there, are, there is in some lakes. Uh, in most lakes there is. But in some lakes, for instance, Bull and Mary deoxygenated during summer. And there's only worms then because they got haemoglobin, so they can stand a bit of, a fair bit of oxygen depletion. Uh, are they eating, they're mostly detritivores or something, are they? Uh, largely detritivores, yes. Okay. Yes. There are a few predators among them. There's a few chironomids that are predators eating the worms and the other chironomids. Yeah. Chironomids are amazing things, aren't they? They're, they... oh, they're, they're the bane of my life, in actual fact. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> they're hard to identify. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got a student working on chronomids at the moment, actually, and um, the reason why we've we we've chosen chronomids is one of the things is because they're such such a diverse group, and he's looking at temporary and, and permanent wetlands, and and is able to distinguish between them based on just 
the, the types of species. Yeah. They're very good as bioindicators. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's 25,000 species or something worldwide, a ridiculous number. Of oh, species. yes. There's a ridiculous number <laughs> in Australia, too. Yeah. <laughs> but it's great. And to... When I was doing this, they were not well known. Mm -hmm. So I had many SPs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can imagine, <laughs> but they're they're much better better known now, which is oh yes, yes, which is reassuring. But there are they are. I mean, I again, I doing my honours, I actually squashed a few heads to try to work out what they were, and I don't think I ended up using any of that data. But I got sort of that. I think I realised how difficult they were to to actually identify. Um, so you worked you worked in these mar lakes, and and after your PhD, I mean, you've had a a, a potted sort of career of, of, of teaching in various places and lecturing and overseas trips I, I, I've seen. But you, you, you started publishing as, you know, after your honours in 1967, so a 53 year history of, of publications. I, I remember reading some years ago of, of uh, G. E. Hutchinson, who I think had a 70 year uh, publication history or something, which I was sort of blown away by that people were would be publishing that for that length of time. Um, and I wanted to ask you before, I mean, we, we can get into other things in a minute. I wanted to ask you sort of the, the, the changes in, in, in the sort of the, what would you, the culture of publishing from when you first started publishing papers in 1967 to 2020, because you're still publishing and reading some of those old sort of papers, when I say old papers, you know, back in the sixties and seventies, when I was um, starting off as a research student, I, I, I sort of, my realization was that those papers were much more voluminous, much bigger, much sort of less tight compared with nowadays. Would you say that's the case? Yes. In fact, I'm ashamed at some of the, <laughs> the longer rooted sentences that I, that I wrote and got away with. You'd never get away with it today. And, and was that because there was, I mean, people weren't so worried about um, being concise or? Yes, I, I think so. And I wrote about some subjects that are pretty minor. <laughs> That's okay. That's what happens, isn't it? As a, as a student and as a researcher, you sort of start off in a particular way of doing things and a bit probably naive and, and oh, yes. develop it over time. Um, so, and, and in terms of getting papers published, because, you know, publish or perish now, and it's, I mean, there's lots more papers and lots more journals and things, but was it hard to get papers published back then? Um, not particularly. Um, it was a lot easier. The editorial process was a lot easier because you would sit, submit a paper as it was to the to an ed, to a journal. The editor would would thank you by letter, of mm. course, and that mm. would take a week or two, and then it would be sent away to a couple of referees, and you'd wait a month or two or three, and you'd get a report back, and the editor would give you some guidance to respond, and you'd respond, and it all took time. Mm -hmm. Uh, really did. Yeah, I look. I, I mean, and I, I was in. Uh, I my well for probably for ten, fifteen years. I was sending off papers by by snail mail to <laughs> to journals and stuff. And it was. It did take a long time, didn't it? It did take a long time. And then it'd all be approved, and it'd be another six months before you saw it in press, in, in or or even a year before you saw it printed. Yeah, but the, 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 but don't you think the exciting thing I found was. Well, apart from many other things that were starting with publishing, but was that you get reprints, sort of hard copy reprints yes. sent to you in a, in a, in a, you know, 50 or a hundred of them yes. or something. Yes. And then people would write to you again by snail yeah. mail, uh, requesting those papers. Yes. That's I love, true. I love that. And in some cases, you, even though you got 50, you would run out. Yeah. 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 Um, these days you really don't know how popular your papers are to any great degree mm -hmm. unless you follow LinkedIn and all the, the information they send you from, oh, you know, you've just had your 55th re reading of some paper. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I, I used to keep, so uh, people, probably younger people don't know, but <clears throat> institutions would make their own reprint request cards often. Yes, absolutely. And you'd have your, your uh, address and name on those cards and you just yes. filled in those cards basically yes. and sent it off to. That, that's Right, yes. And so I used to keep all those because that was, you know, as a young researcher getting, you know, reprint requests from the Czech Republic or Romania yes. or, or you know, Brazil or something was, yes. was quite exciting. And if you got a reprint request from G.E. Hutchison, you were made. Did you get one? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you did? Yes, yes. 
he was oh. my he was my examiner for PhD. You're joking. No. <laughs> I wow. Was rattling in my boots. <laughs> well, um, so again, for people who don't know, you should go look up G. Hutchinson as, as uh, basically the grandfather of limnology worldwide. Yeah. Um, I think the lim limnology of fresh waters was, I mean, a couple of volumes of book, That's which was, volume. you've got a copy of it there, have you? Yes, I'm here. I'm looking at my bookcase. <laughs> uh, look, um, I, it was one of those sort of um, times that, that I had... Um, I, 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 it was in the library and I always wanted copies. I probably could buy some copies now, but I actually, um, the, the closest I got to, to him was, um, I, I sort of, uh, worked, uh, with, with, um, Alan Kovic, who's, a uh, yes, I know that name. Yeah. And he yeah. was, uh, I, he, he's in the States and, and he's, um, works on shrimp a lot in tropical systems amongst other things. And, and Thorpe and Kovic, they've done, I think, macrovertebrates of North America, but, um, he, he was, as far as I remember, he was G Hutchinson's last PhD student. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. that's, that's pretty, pretty exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed by that, that you, um, your, your thesis was examined by him. That's great. Um, so, you're, so you, you were interested in, let, let's go back to your early career. Yeah. So you were interested in, in um, uh, sort of plankton. You moved from an interest in marine to, to freshwater and you stuck with the freshwater side of things. Uh, and um, look, funny enough, about a week ago, I got an email from somebody who's uh, related to Charles State University in some ways, uh, works at TAFE. And his son and he had been out in some paddock and found a whole lot of tadpole shrimp. Um, and didn't really know what they were, and um, and that obviously in a, in a temporary system of some description, and sent pictures of these things, and was asking whether they was they were endangered, whether they're unusual or something. And I said, well, I don't, they're not endangered as far as I know, and they're not not particularly unusual, but they are an amazing group of animals. And and in fact, all these temporary uh, waters crustaceans are, to my mind, just mind-bogglingly fascinating because they seem to come out of nothing so is this part of the um interest for you that this sort of absolutely for, yeah. for the, i've only been interested in temporary waters for the last 20 years right i used to know very little about it until then and it took me a while to get my eye in you might say for identifying things to genera and then to species and realizing what was new and what wasn't but certainly the adaptations for living in in uh, these remote Temporary waters are incredible. So what? What's um okay? So how did you get into the temporary waters field twenty years well, ago? Well, I'm a. I was studying salt lakes in the desert, <laughs> in the Paru. Right. And um, I had nowhere to wash my nets between lakes. You know, you should always wash your nets. And yes. Have everything absolutely clean. And when you're working in coastal environments, it's pretty easy to find a tap in a park. Yep. But out in the out in the outback, it's not. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. And so what I did was I was washing my nets in clay pans because mm. I said nothing that lives in a clay pan is going to live in a salt lake. Uh huh. Uh, and fa I found all sorts of shrimp and so on that I never knew existed. And I sometimes came across a, a small rock pool or a very small site which had even different things in, and that really intrigued me to think that you've got these things living in the size of two square meters. <laughs> So how, so um, explain to me, where do these animals come from? Well, they've got eggs, resistant eggs. Yep. That sit in the bottom mud waiting for the next filling. And they then hatch out and they grow very quickly. Some of them grow so quickly that I've got a problem in the Paru that after it rains, you cannot get there because the roads are impassable. Yeah. And so you don't turn up until two weeks after, after the rains and you sample everything and you get lots of stuff, lots of interesting species. But once I was out there when it rained and I was stuck there, right. and I discovered a new species that grew up in four days to adult, was there for a maximum of 10 days, died off and was gone. So it what, was type of animal, what type of animal was that? It was a little clam shrimp. Right. And uh, from a new genus. Yeah. <laughs> so if you, if, you hadn't, if, you, if you hadn't been there on site, you wouldn't have ever seen it? I would never it. have found it. Wow. So because I've been there quite a few years after rain, you know, a few, two weeks after rain mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and never found it. <laughs> so what's, what's the attraction? I mean, um, I, I don't understand really what's the attraction, I, 
for, for specialising in a temporary system and having such a short life and, you know, from an evolutionary point of view. But diversity is fantastic. Yep. For a start. Yep. And it's turned out that the Paru in general and Australian rock holes in WA and particularly in South Southwest WA are the richest in the world for species. Okay. Right. That, yeah. That's one of the, to me, that's one of the, my major discoveries is to work out all this tremendous diversity. And of course, a lot of them were undescribed. So there was a lot of taxonomy to do. So when you say diversity, um, in micro crustaceans or, or crustaceans, no, I should in, say. In the, in the branchiopods, the fairy shrimps and the clam shrimps. Okay. So how many species are we talking about? We're talking about uh, 60, 70 species of clam shrimp. Wow. And I've described two thirds of those. <laughs> Jeez. And about 50 species of fairy shrimp and I've described about half of them. Unbelievable. And, and, and that, I mean, that, that blows me away, but how, um, so there's a huge diversity, but how patchy is that, is that diversity in yes, the landscape? It's patchy. You've yeah. got to be, you've got to be in the right place at the right time. Right. And I combine a hobby of travel in the outback with a four wheel drive. I'm not a four wheel drive enthusiast that I go into places just, just to get through. I drive it there because I need to get to up from A to B, <laughs> but I do love the outback. Um, and I've, I've been semi-retired for the last 20 years, so I've had time. Hmm. And so, when you're flat out teaching, you just don't have time to do that sort of thing. Yeah, no, I know. So, Brian, um, so they're, ver they're hugely diverse. It's quite patchy. So for a, an individual species, say, of, of clam shrimp, how many water holes might it be in? And therefore, you know, I'm, I suppose what I'm getting at is how, how vulnerable are they to, to extinction if, if, they're, if, if they're so many species and so patchy? Yes, well, I think for most, they're fairly safe because people are not damaging these pools very often. People keep away from these pools. Mm -hmm. um, they look at them, perhaps, but they're not being damaged to any great degree. Mm -hmm. So it's not too much of a problem. Certainly some of them are you're worried about. Uh, and one of the worrying group is, is the clam shrimps in the New England Tablelands in New South Wales. Right. Because many of the habitats, the gyra lagoons, as they're, might, as they're known, have been drained or filled in. <laughs> oh, dear. And so what was available when I did a survey up there in 1967 is not available now. Hmm. So you're, you've got a quite a, a good record of, of what was well, there. Unfortunately, I wasn't interested in clam shrimps then. Uh, hmm. <laughs> and so I only have a few collections. <laughs> So, so, I mean, you know, um, obviously if, if a particular species is found in a hundred different water yes. bodies, that's, that's, that's much safer than if only found oh, in yes. two or three. Absolutely. Are there, are there some that are, are unique to a particular water hole? Almost. Mm -hmm. And one story is as a boy at this Broom's Head place, beach place, there used to be a lot of pools in the sand dunes mm -hmm. after good rains. And they had some clam shrimps in them which I didn't know what they were. I collected them, sent them to the museum. And now I realise that they, I realise that they're a new species. I went to look for them and they've all been mined by the sand miners. So they're gone. And there is one pool left. Oh, really? <laughs> that the sand miners didn't and, get to. And are there clam shrimp in those? Yeah, they're still there. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, 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 that's the worry. It's a worry, in, but it's reassuring that at least one yeah. one spot's left, but that's yeah, that's not great. Left. And it's safe. It's in a national park. Okay. So um, when I asked the question about attraction, I, in some ways I was actually, I wasn't so much asking about your attraction, but what is it, um, but that's, but I've, I'm interested in that too, but what is attracted attractive for a temporary pond or temporary water body for a crustacean? What, what, why, you know, what, if, if the water's going to dry up, and you and you've got such an uncertain future. Yes. Then, then what what is attractive about that particular spot rather than a permanent? Well, system? predators, fish, fish eat clam shrimps and fairy okay. shrimps. Right. So, if you're in a temporary location, you have no fish, which means that your predator pressure is lower. Yes. That doesn't mean to say there are no predators because there are beetle larvae, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which eat clam and fairy shrimps and clodosterins. Yes, yes. But they're flying. They're flying in, presumably. They're flying in, yes. And they like the beetles will come and lay their eggs, and then they'll grow up and they'll they'll grow up eating clam shrimps. <laughs> and do those beetles do those beetles have uh, desiccation resistant eggs? No. No. So they're no. they're, they're well, moving. There's one or two exceptions, but basically no. So they're mostly moving between water bodies. Yes, but they're good flyers. And how far can they fly? Do we know? Well, I've just published a paper on the Gibson Desert on uh, rock pools in the Gibson Desert. And some of the beetles have to fly four, five, six hundred kilometres after each drop for each filling. And they are come in from the west, helped by the wind, the westerly winds. Wow, are you serious? Five or six hundred yes. kilometres? Yes. That's unbelievable. And so they've got to find, the unbelievable part, is they've got to find a little pool that's only got a two square metre or one square metre opening. So how do they do that? Well, <laughs> not very successful because each pool will only have a few beetles in it. So there could be thousands or millions of beetles screaming Lost. around, yeah, and then and then just end up nowhere. Yes. So it's just but like they're, they're very fecund, so you know they produce lots of offspring. That's that's and and these are um, these are essentially aquatic beetles. Yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Ditiscidae. Yeah. Okay. So yep. Oh, that's 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 fascinating. So um so the these. Temporary ponds, essentially, or temporary water bodies, are, are refuges from at least a, a fairly important predator fish. Yes, and the other thing from ecologists, and you haven't asked me this question, is that why would ecologists want to study freshwater pools, temporary pools, is that you can work out a lot of ecological principles from a relatively simple community. Yes. That's only there for a little while. <laughs> yes. So, and so they've been very attractive to, to ecologists. So are we talking about things like succession and stuff like yes, that? Yes, succession's one aspect, because some of the species, and I've seen this, are only there for the first week or two, and then, they, then there's some that only come in towards the end, eating everything up. <laughs> right. I, interesting. I'll, uh, that, I mean, I can, I can see the attraction from, from lots of different perspectives there. Yes. Do, um, and, and these particular... Um, species in these temporary water bodies. Are they unique to those water bodies or do they no, occupy? No, most of the beetles are quite ubiquitous, eurytopic we would say, mm -hmm. found in salt lakes, freshwater lakes, not too salty, but freshwater lakes, um, swamps, all over the place. Mm -hmm. and what, about, what about the clam shrimps and the, the, um, the fairy shrimps, shrimps? And the fairy shrimps are much more circumspect and there's quite a few clam shrimps found only in these rock pools. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, you and I know this, but these guys don't fly. I mean, they're, how, do, how do they disperse? Well, they disperse, their eggs get blown around. Mm -hmm. they, get, they disperse in the wind. Mm -hmm. And they also get dispersed on animal fur. Right. And one possibility I've got for these desert pools in the, in the Gibson Desert is that kangaroos hop down into the pools when they're drying up and dig and their fur probably rubs on the edges and they could be spreading the the eggs of the clam shrimps which live in the pools okay this has been proved beyond doubt for pigs doing it mm -hmm. and elephants mm -hmm. <laughs> but no one's proved it for the kangaroos yet but it's a possibility it sounds it sounds quite likely and that that brings me to the question of um when aboriginal people were you know are moving around yes. in that area and, and presumably carrying water in, in, in many cases, um, would they potentially move these animals around? It would have, they wouldn't have known they were doing it, I no. don't think. No, no, not, I'm not saying they did it purposely, but no. inadvertently. But, but certainly these pools, these, these deeper rock pools are very, were very important for Aborigines during, uh, for, as a water supply. Yes. And yes. also for the first explorers. Of course, yes. Um, and for the gold miners going up to Kalgoorlie, they used to walk from Albany, which was a port, hmm. up to the up to Kalgoorlie, and there was a, a route for them, and that route went from waterhole to waterhole. Oh, really? Yes, well, from these rock holes. There's a lot more rock holes in Western Australia than anywhere else. Okay. In the granite outcrops. And are they fed mostly from rain, or are they? Yes, entirely from from rain. So no no um, groundwater. No. 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 Okay. Interesting. And okay, and uh, you've studied 
as part of your work is NAMAS. That's spelled yes. G-N-A-M-M-A-S. Yes. yes. What are NAMAS? NAMAS are, is the Aboriginal name for rock holes. Okay. And I've tried to use it fairly widely in my papers. Uh, and I've discovered that the, ge the geologists and the biologists use it in a slightly different sense to the Aborigines. The Aborigines, they only used it for the really deep ones which held water. Right. But um, the scientists are using it for all sorts of rock holes formed by solution of the rock, not by water movement, yep. which happens in stream beds, of course. Yes. Uh, by um, by dissolving of rocks rubbing against each other and so on. Whereas in granite particularly, but also of course in limestone, the rock will dissolve by air and uh, HCO3. Okay. And it, 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 it's surprising that granite will rot if it's wet. <laughs> so does that change the water chemistry of that water? Only just, my, my new, my, only just to a small degree. Okay. The thing that does change is the pH during the day with photosynthesis and respiration. And how much does it change? What would it get? It can change from just over seven through to about 8.5 to nine. Okay. So and you've got to be aware of this. I reviewed a paper once in which a student was relating the distribution of something to the pH of the water. And of course, he collected at various times of the day and the, the pH <laughs> varied so much. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You have to be aware of those sort of things, don't yes. you? And, and presumably for the shallow ones, temperature must change enormously yes temperature will and of course the water is is generally crystal clear wow and yes. so yes there are there can be quite wide variations in temperature up at stanthorpe you can get ice <laughs> yeah 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 the pools up there but it doesn't happen I, as far as i'm aware it doesn't happen in southern australia so does that does that mean presumably the animals that are living in there are very tolerant of, of a, a they're range tolerant of, of quite a wide range of temperatures yes and ph's and oxygen levels, presumably, because it's... And yes, yes. But I think sometimes, and we don't, in, in some overnight situations, they can be killed by lack of oxygen respiration. Okay. Yeah, but okay. Got, but that hasn't been really proved, but I think it happens. So in terms of the sort of the nutrient status of some of these rock pools, if, I mean, you've, you're talking about algae growing. Yes. Um, uh, obviously, because of, you know, clarity and sunlight and things. Yes. Is... is um, where are the nutrients coming from that, that feed that? Too? They're coming from insects which die as they are blown in. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how many bee, drowned bees you find in these pools. Right. Uh, they're coming in from um, plant material that's being blown in and some plant material which grows in the thing. Once a nutrient is in one of these rock holes, it's ch the chances of the molecules getting out are not high. Yeah, fair enough. And do they ever become eutrophic? Do they ever go? Yes, they do on occasions, yes. And that's not helped by agriculture in WA. Yeah. And so would the, some, would, would um, become quite eutrophic. Okay. And would, would sort of kangaroo or wallaby, you know, feces cause Feces, problem? yes. And also emus come into them and they can get stuck and they die in them. And that's when you really get a, I like can a imagine. Of nutrients. It's like a big whale dying in the sea yeah, and falling to the bottom. That's exactly of... right. Yeah. Wow. Interesting, interesting stuff. It's a so, sad story to see an emu dead in a pool. Oh, I can imagine. That would, that would cause a, a major... Of lizards, sometimes snakes. And yeah. people often leave uh, sticks in the pool so a, a lizard that falls in can crawl out. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, now, I was coming back to your... Um, you, uh, to your education, um, I was asking about this earlier on. You've not only got a PhD, you've got what's called a DSC. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't think a lot of younger people, in fact, I was a bit uncertain myself, would know what a, a doctor of science is, which is a PhD is a doctor of philosophy, uh, which, which then means you become, you call a doctor, but a, a doctor of science, a DSC, what is that? So a PhD is a a tertiary degree, it's mm -hmm. your first degree is your bachelor's, mm -hmm. then the master's, secondary degree, and your um, PhD is a, is a tertiary degree, it's your third level up. Then the fourth level up is a Doctor of Science, only available in British Commonwealth countries. Okay. And how do you get one? The Americans can never get one. All right. <laughs> well, that's not, not such a bad thing, perhaps. <laughs> now, um, how do, so how does, do, how does one get one? They're not... They're not um, 
they're not just honorary ones, are they? Oh, no. Well, I think in some cases they are honorary. Yeah. Like a doctor of laws is mm -hmm. generally honorary. Mm -hmm. But a doctor of science is generally not honorary. And it requires that you write a thesis, which really is the accumulation of what you put all your papers together and you make a story of them, of what you've shown in these papers. That you're the, you're a, you've made a number of discoveries. You're a recognized leader in, in this particular field. And so my thesis, I think, had four or five sections in it. And one of them was on zooplankton. One was on benthos, because I spent a lot of time working on benthos. I don't want to do it ever again. It takes the back. It's terrible <laughs> and, and filthy. Um, and another one was on salt lakes. And, but all my NAMA work has come after my PhD, my DSC, so that's not included. Yeah, your DSC, um, it was in 1988. Yes. So that's that's uh, 23 years or something after you did honours. And um, 32 years, oh, 32 years ago from now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you don't hear of many of them nowadays. Um, is it something that's gone out of fashion or is it they no longer give them or what? Well, University of New South Wales has offers a DSC. Okay. Because um, I've checked. <laughs> right. If it is available. Um, you know, it's normally from the university you did your undergraduate work in. Okay, okay. Normally. And so is that's it why I went back to the University of Queensland. So is it, is it something that, um, you know, somebody suggests that you do, or is it something that you, that you, you know, you, you just come Well, many through? people do it just so as to get uh, one up on somebody else, so as to get promoted <laughs> to professor. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Well, that wasn't in my case. I just wanted to do it because Bill Williams had one. Therefore, I... I reckon I ought to have one too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 fair enough. I might say that Bill Williams lived in the room next to me at Monash University, and he was a great inspiration to yep. me. Um, I've, he I've, wasn't my supervisor. Yeah, <laughs> I've had a number of people um, I've interviewed so far, um, Terry Hillman and and, um, and Rhonda Butcher, I think, and, and a few people who've been who've talked about Bill Williams. And I, I, I knew Bill Williams... Um, not well, but I knew him well enough to say hello to him and, and, and whatever. But um, unfortunately, he died some years ago. Yes. But it sounds like he was an absolutely inspirational figure. He, he totally was, yes. And he, he sort of changed the limnological landscape in Australia. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, irre irrevocably, whatever the word is. No, it's interesting. Uh, uh, in terms of um, you, uh, the other thing I've noticed with your publications is for a long time, as a sort of quite a in, you know, uh, prolific taxonomist. You're 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 describing new uh, new animals all the time, but the other work you're doing as well during that time. Er, you know, early on you were publishing mostly by yourself. I think yes. you you published a few times with people, but as time's gone on, uh, you've published more and more with other people, and 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 you as seems to be quite commonly the case in terms of research and and publishing um has that been a, a major change that you've seen too from people working sort of by themselves or is that just a taxonomic type thing no i think it's worldwide uh that people now work in groups and once upon a time you largely worked by yourself uh these days you are part of a group and uh, yeah and not all my papers are like that but just quite a few are that's true. And and what, in, in in I know it's probably hard to say, but uh, in your opinion, is it is it more fun, more productive, more interesting to work by yourself or, or with groups? I think you have a generally a better paper if you've had two or three authors, yeah, going through it. <laughs> and is that for taxonomic? Days, is that for taxonomic papers as well? Well. Not so much taxonomic papers, but certainly ecological papers, because mm -hmm. people bring their different skills to a project. Yes, yes, yeah. To have, so they have have those different uh, thoughts and the criti criticisms yes. and things like that make make. And for then a... many of my um, taxonomic papers have been done with up overseas authors who yes. have done the DNA work. I, yes. I have no no um, skills in DNA. I have, don't have the money to set up a lab or, 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 or the expertise that way. And these days in taxonomy, it is wise, if you can, to have a DNA person. So, okay, um, we've mentioned taxonomy a few times and naming of species. Why, 
uh, I mean, because tax on the meat is all, not not quite a dirty word any at the moment, but it's certainly com compared yeah, yeah. with 40, 50 years ago, it, uh, museums are very different places than they were then. Now, and taxonomy is um, is a very is 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 not. It doesn't seem to be as um, respected, at least in Australia, perhaps as it as it once was. Would you agree with that? Or Absolutely. Yes. You don't get a good review uh, status from writing a taxonomic paper. You get better points if you write an ecological paper or a review paper. So do you think people are actually responding to that by not, not getting into those fields? Well, there's not many jobs in museums. When, when, they're, when the curators retire, they're not replaced in Australia. Yeah. And their museums are relying more and more on people like me who are retired and who just love doing it. <laughs> Oh yes, that's a bit scary though because that's a uncertain uncertainty, isn't it? Around it that. is totally uh, yes. What about overseas? And what about overseas in the US I, or Europe? There is limited space overseas, but I think it's 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 at least as bad in Australia, if not worse here. Yeah, we're supposed to have described all our species, but you, if you work with invertebrates, that's not true. Yes. Even with lizards, a few are described, described every year. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah that's right. Um, it's, it's interesting, um, like um, some years ago, I started um, doing some research on sort of early natural history in Australia. Uh, and, and, you know, when the, the French and the, the British were coming out and collecting here on their various expeditions and, and then taking those animals and plants, uh, artifacts and things back to, to um, Europe, mostly. And the first, I don't know how many first sort of dozen or maybe more uh, freshwater fish in Australia were described in, in Europe by Europeans because those those animals there weren't the taxonomists here as such to do that work, uh, and then over the years um, that that changed somewhat. But I was quite I, as a you know young youngish uh, freshwater ecologist, I was wondering why there's these names like Klunzinger and Weber and Valenciennes and uh, Cuvier and, you know, La Billiardaire and all these, these people, Perron. And I had no idea who they were. And, and, and in fact, the sort of my uh, move into some historical ecology and environmental history side of things was because the species I'd studied for my masters, the, the spotted galaxias, Galaxias tritaceus, had its describer's name was what well, I called it was Valenciennes, but it's now I know it's Valenciennes, a French, a Frenchman who described this species. I had no idea at that stage that the French had any involvement in the exploration of Australia or in the description of, of species of fish, for, uh, in, in my case. So I started to, to follow that up uh, and realized that there was this huge trove of, of material that was taken back. To, to Europe to to be described, so um, taxonomists were fairly few and far between in Australia, and they were mostly amateurs back back in the eighteen hundreds, as far as I could tell. One of the one of the um, really interesting people for all sorts of reasons was a the French consul actually who was out here in Australia for quite a long time. Um, what was his Castelnau Count de Castelnau, and he collected quite a lot of his fish specimens from the Melbourne markets as, as a way as a way of and finding new species and describing them. But so in terms of the early taxonomy of, of um, crustaceans and things in, in, you know, fresh water, the sort of stuff that you do, was that developed overseas or, or was it a homegrown industry? Much, mainly overseas people. And what happened is Australian people collected material and sent it over to the British Museum and in this case, you could collect mud and just send the mud away. Oh, really? And then the people overseas would hatch that and grow the animals. Really? And so yeah. there was some very famous taxonomist, one that was called SARS, S-A-R-S, and he described many crustaceans in Australia based on dried mud. And they'd never been out here and had never seen... Never been out here, no, no. So were there many mistakes made because of that? Very few, but there were some... Um, what you might say, some uh, mis misunderstandings of the of the environment that they were dealing with. And what do you mean by that? What do you mean by the misunderstandings? Well, for instance, one species described 
1855 from Sydney, from, the, from pools in Sydney. And it wasn't realised that they were rock pools. Oh, right. <laughs> So he, no thought they were, idea. he thought they were fresh water or something. I just thought they were fresh water swamps and so on. Yeah. But they were in actual fact rock pools on, 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 the, uh, on the upper part of the rock platform. Right. Oh, just okay. beyond the upper part of the rock platform. And some of them are still there at, at Maroubra. Okay. And so, um, and, and are there species of, um, that were described by these um, overseas taxonomists that have never been collected again in Australia? Yes, there are a few like that. Which okay. are very frustrating. So, is that because you don't know where they were collected from, or we don't know the exact spots? And the early descriptions were very poor. Yes. One thing that taxonomy has changed. You could say it's become very scientific and very detailed, uh, whereas early early descriptions were very very loose in mm. in in, the, in their uh, and some uh, some pretty u useless, weren't they? Yes. Completely useless. Yes. And one of the things that. Um, a few of us have done is to upgrade the descriptions of material so it's, you say it's very accurate all done in a certain order hmm. um, and t same sort of terms are used and I've been part of this with uh, a famous American taxonomist who works at the Kansas Biological Survey. Who's that? Uh, Chris, that's Christopher Rogers okay. and, uh, and he's one of these self-taught scientists who didn't have a PhD who just went on. There's, there's an international group of nomenclature, was it the International Union of Zoological Nomenclature? Yeah, oh, or something? yes, yes. And, and they're the ones who control the, the way that things are done, is that right? Oh, yes, yes. Everything is done very systematically. <laughs> and, and you have to pass muster with them in terms oh, of... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Have, yes. You had, have you had species rejected from those guys because of your um, of not um, poor descriptions? No, or but I get comments back. <laughs> Even now, I've just sent a paper, well, a few weeks ago, before I went up to the beach um, on a new species of fairy shrimp from Alice Springs. And uh, I thought I'd done a very good job. And it comes back with about 20 comments on it. <laughs> <laughs> you should know better by now. Yes, right? that's right. I should. <laughs> and and are, you, are you the sort of person who, um, and, and this may have changed over time, um, names things after the place or the habitat or the whatever, or are you keen on naming things after people? I use a variety of uh, approaches. I like using the site. Mm -hmm. And so I've got Queenslandiensis. Um, and so on. Uh, I also like using characters. I think I like using distinctive characters the most. Mm -hmm. Say you get spinosis or something because something's got a lot of spines. Mm -hmm. um, I do name things after people, but that person has to be made a major contribution to the discovery of that species or many species. Okay. So not just not just a, a sort of random person who's well, stumbled on something. Sometimes yes. Hmm. Um, for instance, I've named a species in the Paru after a stockman out there who led me to various sites that I didn't know about mm -hmm. and who collected stuff for me. And he's just an ordinary stockman. <laughs> and now he's disappeared and he's got a species named after him. What's the species? <laughs> Oh, it's called Campbell Eye. He was Campbell. Okay. Name, yes. And then on the other hand, this species I just got from Alice Springs, I'm naming it after the lady who collected it. And so it's the only thing she's ever collected for me. All oh, right. But she's dead keen on this sort of stuff. And she's old. She's older than I am. And she's going to get a tremendous thrill when she sees her name in press. I, look, I think that's a lovely thing. Um, I think that's a lovely thing to, to, to immortalise a person. Um, you know, in, in through a yes, description it, of species. Vexed interest among people that we are, we have arguments about it. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it can be a bit confusing. There's a there was a I'm not sure whether it's still called that, but there's a, a New Zealand um galaxid. Uh I think it might still be called near Kana Burrow's Bur Eye or I think it's Burrow's Eye. And people who don't know think it's because it actually burrows. And it actually does, oh, yes. it does burrow, but it yes. was named after somebody called Burrows. Burrows, yes, so yes. It can get a bit yes. confusing after yes. a, a yes. while. I, I, look, I, I, funny enough, I, I teach animal diversity at, at Charles State University and for first year students. And I, and I often refer to, you know, the, the, the scientific names, Latin names, and, and, I, and I'll um, 
to talk about the etymology of those names and because yes. I think they can be quite, you know, quite useful. And I, and I love the fact, you know, the Galaxids, because I'm a fish person, you know, Galaxiidae is named after um, the stars and, and galaxies, galaxies. Which, 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 which in terms come from the Greek, I gather, which is derived from the same um, word uh, for milk, lactose. So galaxy and um, lack something to do with milk because of Milky Way. I, I get it it's oh, all yeah. related. Yeah. And look, I may have got completely wrong, but I think I'm, I'm halfway there. And um, the students, I think, get a little bit dismayed sometimes, a little bit. Some of them are quite interested and other ones are dismayed because I'm trying, you know, whenever I say a word like, uh, look, I, I call them cephalopods, um, um, you know, squid, octopus, yes. fish things. And kef meaning head and pod and meaning pod foot. Meaning so foot, yeah. I said, if you, if you know these, the, the derivations, then it, it means more to you. And yes. one, of my, one of my students emailed me halfway through the semester and said, oh, Paul, can I just confirm, do we need to know, you know, Latin and Greek <laughs> <laughs> to, to, as part of this study? And I said, no, no, it's, this is just no, out, of, yeah. out of interest. But yes. In I, my case, I did Latin at school. Oh, yes. Which has been very useful. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. Only, I used to hate it, but only to the junior level. Yeah. But still. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, you never know when these things become become yeah. useful. Um, and are you a splitter or a lumper in terms of taxonomy? I tend to be a lumper. Okay. And why instance, is that? I have a species of clam shrimp which lives in rock pools in Victoria, South Australia, and Western Australia. It's very possible they have three different species, but I've got them all under one. Okay. And, and is that, I was going to ask you actually, and this is this related yes. to, to what you're saying here. I, in my, and I, you know, I hope you take this in the, in the, in the way that I intended to, is that um, taxonomists tend to be of a certain type. They need to be, I think they need to be very detailed people, very focused. They're absolutely meticulous. Absolutely. Get carried away with little details. Be extremely organised. Obsessive. Yes, to some degree obsessive. Yes. So do you think and you need to have very good eyesight? Well, a very not so much very good eyesight, but you need to be able to see things that other people necessarily can't see. Hmm. And some of that thing, you've got to remember what you saw in one thing, and apply it to something else. Oh, yes, that's. You didn't realise it at the time? Yes, yes, yes. And then you've got to work out which are important characters and which are not important. Yeah. And I've had no particular training by anybody, but I've learnt over the years. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, and, and I, I, in my own case, occasionally um, we did a key to the larva, larvae of, of, of fish in the Murray Lane Basin. And, and people used to ask me, until we did the key, people asked me, well, what? You know, how do you know that that's a whatever? Because they don't yeah. look like anything like the adult. And I said, well, it just looks like it. <laughs> but you have to actually then, if you're doing the taxonomy or, the, or a key, yeah. you actually have to describe it in a way that other people can see that as well. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And that's a task, isn't it? And I think to me, one of the fun things, there's two fun things in taxonomy. One is making up a key at the end of it when you've done the genus, mm. you've revised the genus and you make up a key. That is demanding but it's fun and you get it all out and it works now that's funny you should say that because um because of covid and because of the lockdown uh, i had to run a residential school for my animal diversity students and normally what they do is they come to the, uh, the these are the distance students they come to yes. the lab and we spend three days of intensive lab work looking at all animals pretty much from from sponges up to mammals and they have to draw them and work out the taxonomy and, and describe the key features and things. But they couldn't do it because they couldn't come onto campus. So I had to come up with an alternative way of doing things, uh, both for, for the lab work, but also the prac exam, because they do a prac exam at the end. And, and the thing I came up with at, at the end, and, and, and only, only time will tell whether uh, it really works, I suppose. And, and, but I've done it. I did it earlier, uh, late last month. Uh, late the month before in late August was like um, they had to do a dichotomous key yes. as their final part of their, their, their exam. So we spent the, the two and a half days essentially exposing them online to these animals that they've already done lectures on in the past and then uh, how to construct a, a dichotomous key. And those people who don't know what a dichotomous key is, it's the key 
it's a it's a, a series of what they call couplets, which are, are, are alternative. I don't know what you'd call them, alternative questions. Types of a character. Statements, yeah, of a character, yes. which lead you down to uh, the, the animals that you've got. And, and, and through the, the questions or the statements about characters, you can write off one or, or the other and you end up hopefully identifying the animal that's in front of you. Um, and so what we did at the end of it, I gave them 12 random animals. And these, as I said, they range from sponges essentially to, to mammals, to, to different types of mammals. And they had to construct a key from that. And, and it was a really interesting learning process. I don't know whether they found it fun, like you just described it. But for me, I thought it was a really, a way of putting all their knowledge yes. into, into one thing. And when it works, it's very satisfying. <laughs> Yeah, and, and look, for most of them, it worked. I'd say for maybe a quarter of them, it didn't work. Um, you, know, you know, they got to, when I say it didn't work, most of them were able to construct a key. But at some stage in that key, they, they made a poor decision about a, uh, a character, um, which, which sent you off in the wrong direction. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I think it was a very useful exercise. And it was a good endpoint to the for, for studying. They were working towards... Yes knowing the feature the key features of these animals um, and yes. having to know what the 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 key features of the phyla they were looking at were but yes. also sometimes at the family level because it was yes. the, that was the lowest we got to it, the other thing that's enjoyable about, about taxonomy is the actual names that you come up with and some of my favorites one of them is boomerangia because <laughs> it's yeah. got a major feature which is shaped like a boomerang oh really and <laughs> so you that named made, that one that might that? sorry did you name that one yes yes okay so what, that was what type of animal uh, is that? one of my favourite names. <laughs> what type of animal is that? Uh, it's a uh, fairy shrimp. Okay. Around, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's some there's some wonderful names out there. Um, yes. That yes. People, uh, have you do you know some other ones that? Oh, acidophilia okay. lives in acid pat pools. Okay. Acidophilia. Yeah, I like loves that. Acid. Yes, yes. That's an obvious one. Uh, yeah. I've I've. I, I've, I've just, yeah. I've heard some. Um, I've heard some. One of my ones is uh, one I know of, and I can't even remember. I think it's like a, um, a spider or something, which is Bram something Bram Stokeri, which is yeah. named after the the the, the yeah. author of of. Um, and then Acula. there are sometimes the common names. People in WA have to deal a fair bit with the uh, brine shrimp. There's uh, twelve species of brine shrimp in WA, eighteen for the whole of Australia, and one of them has. Uh, Triangle, well, pyramid-like, um, uh, pyramid-like um, growths on the front of it, and it's commonly called Madonna tits. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, yes. not me. It's the uh, people who are deal dealing with it. You just is that name for describing it? No, though. just as just as well. Oh, that's yeah. look that 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 is. Fascinating. And, and does that mean that sometimes people find it hard? Like if there are so many species, I know people yes. describing bacteria find yes. it sometimes hard to find new names for things. Yes, it is. And, uh, but when you start off, it's also hard working out the diversity, what species are different. Yes, yes. Uh, and it's, it, it takes you a while to get your eye in. Really so so um, on a more sort of almost serious note, why do we need taxonomists? At all. Because a number of reasons, um, bio indicators, you must get the right species for the right conditions. Mm -hmm. And that's useful in streams, in swamps, lakes, as you say, for your coronamid stu student working on coronamids. Mm -hmm. So you need to know the right species. Um, in climate change, it's very possible that species are going to be moving around from the tropics further south as uh, conditions become warmer. And I think that's already happening in yes. some clam shrimps because we've got some tropical clam shrimps turning up in the Paru now. And I've been going to the Paru for 30 years mm. and to find an uh, extra species out there, heck, what's going on? Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> that, 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 that does tell you something's happening, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. So there are a couple of reasons why it's important to know the actual species you're dealing with. Yeah, and, and, um, and the fact that particular species are there um like you know the, I, again i teach this to the uh, river river ecology students is that uh, macro and microvertebrates um, are really useful indicators because they sort of integrate over time so they tell you something about what's been in in the environment there 
for a period of time rather than just taking a, a, a spot reading of, of a water quality. You might, I, rem, I remember years ago going, yeah, yeah. To, going to a stretch of river or a stretch of stream. It was a, a fairly small stream. And we had electrofish and we were electrofishing away and we we're dip netting it. We didn't catch anything at all. No fish, no shrimp. The shrimp weren't popping up at all as they often do when you're electrofishing, nothing. And we thought this is very weird. And we, we, we measured the, the water quality and the pH was fine. The oxygen was fine. There was water there, you know, obviously. Uh, it was all great. And we just couldn't work out what was going on because there was nothing there. And we went to the local pub and we were staying there and we, we talked to the the, the pumpkin who was sitting there and we said just can't understand why we didn't get anything in this stream and he said well there was no water there three days ago <laughs> <laughs> ah okay that makes it all now yeah. now we know why yeah. Yeah. um so that the, the animals tell you a lot about things which the water quality may not tell you exactly at that particular point in time yeah hey um um, before we finish, we're getting close to the hour, would you believe? It's gone very quickly. Um, you were telling me that, that there's, I think, there's some water holes in, in the Paru that have never been salty before, but are now salty. Is that right? What's happening uh, there? Not quite true. Okay. Um, there are some salt lakes in the Paru. Right. And we've just had in March the biggest rainfall event. Oh, they become fresh water. Out there. Yes. And one system which used to be salt has become fresh okay okay and as it's slowly becoming salt again and its last trip has just turned from fresh to salt there's a variety of organisms that i have not seen in that system before now they're not new species i've seen them in other freshwater sites somewhere else but i've got a different ecology hmm. instead of having salt lakes i've got freshwater lakes now one of the salt lakes which was freshwater briefly for a couple of months, it's now about seawater salinity and behaving normally as it normally does. Mm -hmm. And what's its fauna like now? Sorry? What's its fauna like now? Its fauna now is, is a typical salt lake fauna of a thing called Daphneopsis, which is a water flea and um, various ostracods and rotifers and so on. And did everything, did everything that was normally in that uh, die during, when it was fresh? Well, I would imagine that um, the eggs were just sitting there waiting for the right salinity to come along. Okay. Even though it was fresh, just waiting for the right salinity. Okay. And then they've hatched. And that's interesting in a, in a case because that particular lake has no brine troop in it. Where normally it has many. And because it went through this freshwater stage in which the brine shrimp don't hatch, mm. uh, they never hatched out. Okay. Oh wow, that's interesting. And have you never? You said you've never seen it fresh before. I've never seen it fresh water before, and I've been going for thirty odd years. Now I'm not out there for every fill. No. But most of the fills I'm there sooner or later, and the um, the one that's was is normally saline, and is just turned fresh, just turned uh, at the borderline into salt water. Um, it has a whole range of species, as I said, that I've never seen in that system before. Okay. Where'd they come from? That's bizarre, isn't it? Um, um, we've got a, 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 just a few more minutes. I've got a couple of things to ask you. But one is that um, I know that with, um, with some rotifers that they've never found males, I don't think. Is that right? Is that that's, be right, yes. yes. Because they, they, so they go through what's called parthenogenesis. Oh, they, don't, yes, yes. They, they can produce um, viable eggs, the females, without, yes, without mating. Without Does that, is, is, that a, is that a common thing amongst the... Um, the uh, yes. Yep. Um, and, and one genus of clam shrimp, they go, they're mainly what we call hermaphroditic females. Mm -hmm. So that they do spawn a few males, but very rarely. And then, of course, there are quite a few, um, quite a few clodosterans, which never have, or rarely have males. Hmm. And that's an interesting thing too, as it's, as it's been going from salt, to, fresh to salt, I'm seeing males of some species that I haven't seen before because they're now finishing up, <laughs> if you like. Wow. Yeah, wow. Their, their life cycle is just about finished because it's becoming too salty for them. Yeah. And uh, so they produce some males and they'll mate with the females and, and lay proper eggs, which will be resistant. So the, the, um, it's the diploid eggs, the... Yes, the, they're the, going the to be resistant. Yeah, to, um, yep. to yes. desiccation. Okay, and look, the last thing I want to ask you before we finish up is, what's next? What are you, what are you, what's, what's, what are you going to be doing over the next few years? in terms of research? Well, my wife would like to see me retire completely. 
I can't see that happening. No, I can't see it happening either. I have a, a few taxonomic things that I want to do, which I haven't been able to do this year because of COVID. Mm -hmm. The museum, for instance, is closed for research workers. Um, and some of that is material that I bought that I had sent out from England. I went to, I spent a, a month in the British Museum in 2018 and uh, I had stuff sent out to me from there. And it's sitting in the Australian Museum waiting for me, but I'm not, not allowed to look at it yet. Oh dear. Oh, that's... Which is uh, frustrating, you might say. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've got a little bit of uh, taxonomy to do. I've got, I should write a book or a large review article on all my work on, on rock holes in Australia. But sure. I'm held up because the two projects I'm on, one's in Queensland and one's in Victoria, and I can't get to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's And I've, I've, I've lost my research license in Victoria this year because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, because I just can't get there. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's in the Grampians in Victoria, which is a, a shame. So, and I don't know when I'm going to get back to that, but I, if I'm going to write up and review all my Australian work, I have to finish that Victorian work and I have to finish the Queensland work. I well, let's, fingers crossed that, um, that the, the, we can find a vaccine and that the, the COVID. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm frustrated there. I'd like to write a review of all my Salt Lake work. And in some respects I've written it because I was asked to write a chapter on Salt Lakes for a, uh, book in, in America. And I've written it, but uh, it's very Australian biased and I expect to be knocked around by the reviewers. <laughs> oh, well, if they reject it, then you can, as you yes. say, pub publish it. Yes, I publish it separately, but we'll see. So you get a few, a few, um, a few yes, projects. Yes, a few things in, on the plate, but not, not too many. Yeah, no, that, that, that'll keep you going, I'm sure. But I love field work, and so I'll just keep going to the Paru because it's, I, you know, I know the situation. I have a house to stay in. I have very cooperative landowners. That sounds perfect. It's just a long, uh, long way to go. It is. It's 1,000, well, 880 k or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and oh, well, but, you know, I, the landscape, I know, the landscape out there is, is just wonderful. So yeah. I, can, I can see the attraction. All right, well, we might finish up. And um, thanks very much, Brian, for um, uh, um, doing the interview. It's been really, really interesting to, to hear about your work and your career and um, uh, wish you luck with um, the, the projects in the future. And I hope that yes. things do improve COVID-wise, that you can get out and about and, and, and do more of it. Yeah, my work is not in the lab. It's in the field. <laughs> oh, that's it. Must be some lab work for describing these yeah, things. Yeah, there is of course. some, but not, not much these days. It's basically field work. Fair enough. All right. Thanks, Brian. Okay. See ya.